thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody from this room and from uh, outside this room, from, uh, from online. Uh, we are very happy to, to have uh, here today with us Professor Fergus McNeil, uh, who will give the, the keynote speech for, for uh, this uh, edition of the International Training School on Core Correctional Skills. Uh, Fergus is known for many, many uh, things, for uh, a lot of uh, uh, his work. Uh, but lately, he's uh, very well known for two things, at least for one, for the desistance paradigm, for the desistance model that uh, uh, he, together with uh, some of his colleagues, created uh, uh, to complement uh, the r, &R the mainstream, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, framework that we are, we are all aware of. And uh, of course, he is also known in the last few years for his uh, guitar uh, 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 lessons and uh, classes and uh, creation involving um, uh, people involved in justice in, in Scotland to create uh, uh, songs and uh, uh, broadcast them for, uh, for others. Um, without uh, further ado, I would like to give the floor to Fergus, who will talk to us about uh, rehabilitation and the importance of uh, recognition. So, Fergus, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um... I'm very grateful to you for inviting me. Um, can you hear me okay in the room? Is the microphone on? That's better. It goes green when it's on, not red. But yeah, okay. <laughs> Understood. I'm glad we got that sorted. Okay, so before I get started properly, I wanted to ask the room a couple of questions. Um, I titled the talk Supporting Reintegration. Can you raise your hand if you think that supporting reintegration is one key purpose of your job? Supporting the reintegration of people who are who have offended. Um, can you raise your hand if you think it's the key function, the key task that you have? I mean philosophically, as an aim or an objective, is supporting reintegration the key function or purpose of your job? Not so sure. Okay, last question for now. Do you see yourself as being involved in the administration of punishment? Raise your hand if you do. Yes. Okay, so a few people do. Okay, well, let me let me start with punishment. I think... Um, Many of us that have come to, oh, I can't advance my slides at all. Hang on. Oh. It's one of these things where they might advance slowly and surprisingly just to disrupt my flow. Um, many of us who come to the business of rehabilitation and, and reintegration or of corrections or of probation more generally struggle with the concept of punishment and struggle with an acceptance of the fact that we work within a system which is a penal system. It's a system which is designed and intended in almost every, in fact, in every liberal democracy that I'm aware of, we're working in a system of punishment, even if the objectives that we pursue might be somewhat different. So let's start with a classic definition of what punishment means in the context of criminal justice. And this comes from uh, a Cambridge-based philosopher, legal philosopher called Ancha dubois pedan And she's drawing on a standard definition which has been used by legal scholars for decades, perhaps for half a century. In the standard definition, punishment means the intentional infliction of harm or hardship on a person. So that's condition one. It has to be hard. It entails harm. It's imposed, secondly, in order to reproach or censure a person for a criminal wrong. So there's a core communicative function in play. We're trying to say something in punishment about the wrongdoing. And thirdly, it can only be imposed by someone who is legally, lawfully entitled to make this wrong his or her business and to perform the act of punishment. So these are the three standard conditions in legal philosophy for punishment within a liberal democratic state. Okay. Now, before we go even beyond the first slide, we've hit arguably the core problem 
of practice which aims to rehabilitate, to reintegrate, to reduce offending, to establish a working alliance, to work with people in order to improve their situation or their social inclusion. And the core problem is that we're doing that in a system which is premised on the intentional infliction of harm. Let me ask you this question. How well disposed are you to people who impose harms upon you? How likely are you to listen to them when they try to influence your conduct? Not much. I see a hand raised in the third row. Did you want to ask something? Okay, okay. I'm being deliberately provocative here, but I think it's important to set this framework and to understand the, uh, the terrain on which we're trying to do something constructive in probation uh, work. Let me try and move on. There's good news. Here's the good news. This also comes from Ancha dubois pedan She says there's something missing in that standard account of punishment. And let me just read this slowly, including for the translator. As a general social practice, punishment does not merely mark out the punishee, that's the punished person's actions as wrong, and blame him or her for engaging in the wrongful act. It also defines how both the punisher and the punishee, the punished person and the person administering punishment will move forward from here. So there's a, there's a backward looking aspect to punishment, which is offering the censure, offering the reproach, insisting that some kind of hard treatment has to be applied to provide that censure and that reproach to mark the, the offense as wrong. But there's also this forward looking aspiration. And here it is, the penal agent, the punisher, that's you guys, lays down the terms of his or her future coexistence with the offender in a shared social world. Because this is punishment's central social function, there is reintegrative momentum inherent in punishment that gives the offender himself an interest in being punished. Far from threatening or challenging an offender's membership in the community, punishment reasserts or reinforces it. So the point of punishment in this account of what's going on when liberal democracies punish is that we're trying to find a way to re respond to a wrongdoing that brings the person back to the community and that establishes the terms on which we will live together in a shared social world. So the purpose of punishment is not just to administer the hard treatment. It's not just to communicate the censure. It is to bring the person back to make uh, the person who is estranged or made strange by punishment, to bring them back to us as one of us. Okay. So much for legal philosophy. I'll switch registers now and go straight into criminology and talk a little bit about desistance. The link here is that there is a science, there's a, an extensive body of evidence about the process of coming back, about the process of desistance, and about the process of reintegration. Now, the two terms are not quite synonymous, as I'll say in relation to the next slide, defining desistance is really complicated, but it's about getting beyond offending. And I think it's also about getting back or moving forward into a positive social position. Before I get to the definition, let me give you four theories of desistance, four ways in which we have come to understand how desistance happens. And these theories are based largely on studies with people who've been involved in persistent offending. Okay, so we're not talking about drifting into and out of offending in adolescence. That's quite a normative process. Um, we're more interested where things have gone more seriously wrong and people have got trapped in cycles of offending, criminalization and penalization. So the first theory says people will grow out of it. Age makes a difference. Um, offending, even persistent offending, is mostly uh, undertaken by relatively young people. Um, and by the age of 30, even most persistent offenders or people who have been involved in persistent offending will have desisted 
if not completely, then to a very significant degree. So there's something to do with aging, whether it's physiological or psychological, we're not sure. Possibly it is, but it might also be linked to social changes that are indexed by or associated with aging. So as developmental psychologists tell us, after we go through the turbulence of adolescence, where we're struggling to establish our identity or suffering from confusion about who we are, we move into adulthood. Early adulthood, the key conflict, according to Erickson, I think, is uh, intimacy versus isolation. Are we going to find our way into uh, relationships in, in which we feel deeply connected with another human being and deeply seen? That's intimacy. Or are we going to struggle with feeling isolated and alone? And then as we move on, we get into generativity versus stagnation. As we mature into adulthood, we need to feel, according to this theory, we need to feel that we are somehow making a meaningful contribution to society or more narrowly to the well-being of people that we love. That's generativity, and it's expressed in having children, it's expressed in pursuing an education, it's expressed in work, it's expressed in, in, in all sorts of civic activity that we might undertake. So um, for the psychologists studying our development, moving through these challenges successfully requires all sorts of maturational processes. Um, but it also, as is already obvious, involves changing social connections changing ties. In, the, in English, we have the expression, the ties that bind, meaning the, the connections that uh, bind us into relations with other people which are mutually supportive, but also mutually constraining. Because if I'm committed to my relationship or committed to the well-being of my children, that means that I have a stake, a stronger stake, a reason for avoiding trouble, particularly trouble with the legal system that might threaten my relationship with my partner or my relationship with my children. So social bonds connected to family, connected to work, again, connected to education, perhaps, are linked to maturation. So the second set of theories are more focused on the social dynamics, and they're usually produced, it's no accident, by sociologically minded criminologists. So they stress the sociological, the psychologists tend to stress maturation. And then there's a place where they meet, which is in relation to narrative identity. So this concerns how, as we age, we develop a new or a changing sense of who we are and our place in the world. Um, and that isn't static for any of us, nor is it singular. We all have multiple identities, and they are in motion, not fixed. Some of them are relatively stable and enduring, and some of them are more vulnerable to change. So to give an example, when I was, well, let's not give my age away, 20 years ago, I had my, my wife had, had our first child, a daughter, she's obviously now 20. As soon as she was born, I became a father. It's a stable identity. It's meaning changes. Okay, so being a father of a newborn, to quote Shakespeare, mewling and puking, a, a baby in arms demanding attention, Anna, I can see you're relating to this, um, is different from being the father of a 20-year-old, a mature, uh, lovely, intelligent, and independent person, um, soon to pass our driving test, and therefore able to drive me home from the pub. So... <laughs> The, the dynamics of, of the identity of father are, are to a certain extent stable, but also continue to evolve. The same is true of long-term intimate relationships. The meaning of them changes. The, the way in which I see myself changes in that context. An offending identity, one which is established through processes of criminalization, um, is a particularly difficult identity to transcend or move beyond. And it's partly so difficult because the criminal justice system is so good at degrading people, applying labels to them and making the labels stick so that those labels are internalized. And as, uh, was it Lamert, the, the, the classic deviancy amplification thesis? So I'm treated as a deviant 
and I begin to see myself as such, and we get a, a syndrome of, of um, a vicious cycle being created. So changing from the identity of offender to the identity of something beyond that is a difficult thing to do for people who have been heavily criminalized and penalized, but it happens, and it happens for people going through resistance. And lastly, and perhaps more uh, prosaically, the places and the spaces that we inhabit in our daily lives and the routines of our daily lives have a profound effect on our behavior. Where we choose to spend our time, who we choose to spend our time with, what we choose to spend our time doing, at what times of the day or night, week or weekend, that makes a big difference to how we behave and to how we see ourselves. So if I spend all my time in the gym, hanging out with fit people, working out on my on my body, then I'll come to identify as a gym bunny, like as a, uh, this is my son I'm speaking about now. He's 17 and built, as we say in Scotland. Um, anyway, so the places that we spend our time, the activities that we devote ourselves to also have impacts on our identity and on our behavior. And the good news is we don't have to choose between these theories. I think most resistance scholars nowadays tend to accept that all four bodies of work are relevant to explaining resistance. The thing is to explain the interactions between them. Now, if this sounds too abstract, immediately think about somebody that you're working with and ask yourself the question, how, how mature are they? And what has affected their process of psychological maturation? They've been to prison, for example, for a long time. What might that have done to their process of maturation? Um, how, how, how might I understand that? How might I support their maturation and development psychologically? What are their social ties? To whom are they bound? And with what consequences? Um, how do they see themselves? What is their narrative identity? Is it fixed? Is it changing? Is it contradictory? Do they have multiple identities in different contexts, in different social worlds that they inhabit? And where do they spend their time? With whom? Doing what? What's important to them? Who's important to them? So these are all very practical and, and uh, highly relevant questions for practice, which I think should be an, an absolutely integral part of assessing someone at the beginning uh, of a period of trying to support them, but also all the way through that period. Now, it's important to stress that evidence about desistance is not the same as evidence about what works. This is not a body of evidence which is concerned with interventions in the first instance. It's a body of evidence that tries to understand a process of change. So just as teachers need to understand child development and everything that influences it. So probation officers and people who work in corrections need to understand desistance. That does not mean that teachers shouldn't care about which pedagogical approaches are most effective. And it does not mean that people who work in correctional systems shouldn't care about evaluation evidence about interventions, whether that's RNR or other models of effective rehabilitation practice. It's not a question of choosing between them. It's a question of understanding both bodies of evidence and their interactions. So the question what works in correctional practice, including the question of core correctional skills, is a really important question. But there's a question before it, logically, prior to it, which is how and why do people change? Okay. And that's what this evidence is trying to address. And incidentally, it's what this talk is trying to do, both by giving you legal philosophy and by giving you criminological evidence. I'm trying to lay the foundations on which you build core correctional practices. Because the practices and the skills that matter depend on your understanding, firstly, of your objective. Is it reintegration? Is it something else? And of the process that you're trying to support. Okay, so I said definitions were tricky in relation to resistance, so I'm going to just briefly give you the three dimensions or three aspects that surface when we try to define resistance. The first um, set of definitions are definitions essentially of 
what's called primary or act desistance. And their desistance is defined simply as the absence of offending behavior. I say simply, but it's not simple at all. Is it the absence of all offending behavior or is it a change in offending behavior from serious to trivial? So does somebody desist if they stop committing serious repeated violent acts but continue smoking cannabis in a country where that's illegal to possess? Is that desistance or not desistance? It's not a straightforward question. It's progress. It might or might not be desistance depending on the legal framework. But act desistance only takes us so far because a person can also stop offending without changing. So to give you a very trivial example, a person whose modus operandi for committing house, house burglaries or house breaking, as we call it in Scotland, breaking into a house, is to climb up a drain pipe and enter an upper window. Let's say they fall and break a leg. And they have to wear a cast on their leg for three months. Amazingly, they don't offend for three months. Well, it, it is desistance, sort of, but it's also meaningless because nothing's changing which will affect their behavior in the longer term. So identity desistance is different. Imagine that the burglar falls, breaks their leg, and experiences a kind of moment of reflection where they're lying in pain in the hospital bed thinking, is it really worth it anymore? Is this really all I'm going to amount to? Maybe I should take this sort of physically enforced break as the start of a change. Maybe I need to be someone else. That is the beginning of a process of secondary desistance or identity desistance. And then thirdly, tertiary or relational desistance is about the response of your community to the change within you. So I might stop offending. And I might see myself no longer as an offender, but if you still see me as an offender and still reject me and exclude me from the life of our community, then my primary and secondary resistance might break down, not because of me, but because of you. It might be that your reaction, which is saying you're never getting back, you'll never be with us again, that reaction might trigger me to say, well, I'm going to use bad language here, but this is academic language. Fuck it, is what I might say. There's an article in the British Journal of Criminology, which is called Fuck It Moments. And it's about the moment when a person trying to change gives up because of adverse social reaction and adverse systemic criminal justice reaction to them. Um, and it's a very powerful article by Mark Halsey and colleagues in the British Journal of Criminology. So clearly we have to not provoke that moment um, in the way that we respond to people. Okay, so there'll be a technical problem. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so the process of desistance has been articulated um, in more detail in a number of different studies. This is one which concerned uh, young adults involved in very persistent offending in the city of Sheffield in England. And uh, Bottoms and Chapland, two very distinguished and senior uh, British criminologists, identified the steps that those who managed to desist in their sample um, went through. So first of all, a bit like the burglar in the hospital bed, something triggers or provokes a wish for change. And the trigger can be an adverse event, like breaking your leg while trying to break into a house. It can also be a positive event. So maybe the birth of a child or the development of a new relationship. Something triggers me to think differently. So I want to change. I'm beginning to think differently about my life. But this is only a a thought process until step three, which is where the person takes action for change, concrete action. And as soon as that step is taken, we get to step four, which is the person meets obstacles. And there are many obstacles. You 
you could probably lift a dozen obstacles if I asked you right now. We don't have time, but maybe later. What might the obstacles be? It could be uh, the relationship is problematic. It could be that old friends are trying to tempt me into familiar behavior. It could be that an old adversary is trying to tempt me into a fight. It could be that I have to declare my criminal record every time I try to seek a job in the legitimate labor market. It could be that my community refused to accept that I'm making a change. It could be that I have a bad day. So there are many different obstacles. If I successfully overcome the obstacle and maintain the change, and if people notice that and reinforce it by saying, well, Fergus, you are not the person you were six months ago. I can see a real difference in you. Um, it's impressive. Keep going. So if, if that's what I hear, that reinforcement, then I might get to the point where at the top of this, uh, these steps, I'm sustaining the change. Alternatively, if I hit the obstacle and fail, then I go back to the beginning. Um, and what makes the difference in the literature and the evidence base here between relapse and maintaining change is two things. One is the social support available to me. So when I hit the obstacle, who can I ask for help? And what can they do? Uh, that's, that's point one. Point two, what are my capabilities as an individual, my capacities to think my way through this problem, to, uh, to break it down, to generate strategies for getting around it? or over it, or through it, or under it. Um, so that's about me. It's about my education. It's about my uh, attitudes. It's about my skills. It's about some of the things that you will be talking about trying to support people to develop. Um, so social support and personal capabilities uh, are influential on whether or not the change can be sustained. So then we, we go a little bit further in the desistance research and we identify a set of core principles to guide practice. Um, and I'll just very quickly go through these for you. Um, first of all, we've, we've got to be realistic about the process. It's hard to change deeply entrenched patterns of behavior, especially when those behaviors and the way that the state has responded to them have made that label criminal stick so hard. So that diminishes my opportunities, it weakens my social support, and it probably damages my capacities individually as well. Punishment disables people from making good choices about their lives, particularly imprisonment. Um, it, it can have an incapacitating effect, not in the way that the system intends, which is to hold you and prevent you from offending. It can have a long-term incapacitating effect by stultifying or slowing your psychological development, your ability to acquire skills um, and, and gain an education. So for all those reasons, it's really difficult to make these changes, particularly in the social context that many desisters face. So we've got to manage that lapsing, relapsing process sensitively and thoughtfully. And we've got to expect, frankly, that people are going to cycle through that process many times before they manage to overcome the obstacles and sustain the change. That's easy to say, it's also hard to manage in a correctional system which demands compliance from day one and maybe isn't so sensitive or thoughtful about the ways that it manages non-compliance. So secondly, we need to individualize support for change, recognizing that different people will experience change in different ways and certainly in different social contexts and cultural contexts with different resources at their disposal. That requires individualized assessment and, for example, sensitivity to diversity, different in relation to different genders, different sexualities, different ethnicities, um, people with different kinds of disabilities. There's all sorts of things which will alter both individual capacity and social support. We need to build and sustain hope for change. That's why I like the Sala de Espera. What was it again in Spanish? Sala de Espera, the waiting room, the place of hope. I'm mistranslating, I know, but um, I like the idea of of maybe the maybe actually the room where you sit down with the person you're supporting is the waiting room 
but also a waiting room in that lovely Spanish sense where you're positively that place is is positively filled with hope um maybe because it's a place where a person recognize they recognizes that they can go to develop their strengths to be respected for what they bring but to be given support to develop more where their agency and ability to determine the direction of their own lives will be reinforced not undermined where uh the value and importance of their relationships will be respected and recognized and worked with not against so the relationships that matter to the person have to be part of what you think about as a practitioner where social capital social connections i'll come back to this in a moment are being developed as well as human capital and where progress is recognized and celebrated as my colleague shad marina often says the criminal justice system is expert at degradation rituals the courtroom in particular um, is a place of degradation uh, it's not so good at status elevation rituals universities are very good at status elevation rituals when we do graduation maybe you'll have a graduation at the end of this week there's a challenge for you and to set something up there you go you will have a status elevation ritual at the end of the week so think about taking that home with you okay I want to stress the social indesistance, and that's because I know that I think in most of what follows this week, necessarily, you're going to focus on the core skills for working one one to one, uh, maybe also in groups, but with individuals on the stuff that they can influence to change their future. But it's easy when talking about evidence based practice to forget that just equipping an individual with new capacities is not enough. And I'm going to say a lot about this later, but here's the evidence from desistance about why it's not enough. Stephen Farrell, I think, was the first to stress the importance of social capital in desistance. And here he's talking about um, networks of relationships that we can trade on to make progress in our life. So it's capital in that sense. It's something that we can put to work to support us to achieve what we want to achieve. He talks about three kinds, and this is from the wider literature on social capital. Bonding social capital is your close ties to family and friends. And usually that's uh, within a culture. So it's kind of homogenous. In fact, the word that sociologists use here is homophily. It's the love of people like you. Bonding capital is, 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 is kind of characterized by homophily. Bridging capital, is about connections to people who are differently placed in society from different social groups from different places and bridging social capital is really critical for example in employment seeking and you guys are spending the week developing bridging social capital after three o'clock right <laughs> So you will you will get to know each other and you'll be expanding your reserve of bridging social capital to probation practitioners and leaders in many different jurisdictions in Europe. And you, you can use that later. You'll make friends here that you can call or email and say, how do you deal with de-radicalization in Sweden? Is it the same as what we do in Catalonia? What could we learn from a conversation? And you can use the assets that come from the possibilities of your connection to advance your project. That's bridging social capital at work. Linking social capital is about your connections with people who are differently placed in the social hierarchy. So if you get connected to somebody who is a, a Mark Theron, a distinguished leader of an institution like this, that can open other doors for you. Um, so bridging and linking social capital are linked to social mobility. To moving forward in life and, and in a sense also to moving up the problem is most people in, involved in persistent offending have got very little bridging social capital their lives are quite narrow the sort of social capital they have is bonding social capital and often the bonds are with people who might be involved in co-offending with them so looking for positive forms of social capital can be difficult. Pepe Thied, who's based at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, has studied this in the context of Catalonia and Spain. And he finds that for people in Spanish prisons trying to desist from offending, 
the key social support that they call upon is the immediate and extended family and to a lesser extent the community and this is linked to catholic theology to uh, spanish cultural traditions um but what pepe also notices and this is crucial is that it's not just the existence of those connections it's what they mean to the people involved what to what extent are people invested in those relationships both ways and what what resources does that open up or foreclose in terms of supporting change and then lastly beth weaver uh, based in the university of strathclyde who i think has done possibly the most interesting work on this in a book called offending no offending and desistance Offen yeah i can't believe i've forgotten the name anyway amazing book um that's based on beth's phd which studied a group of men who had co-offended together in a gang as young people and young adults but who then co-desisted for the most part and this contradicts some of what we talk about in the big four or the big eight linked to the rnr model once your anti-social associate might become a pro-social model depends on what's happening to them and form them so the assumption that we just have to sever people's ties with anti-social associates is oversimplified actually because the meaning of a social relation can change just as people can change so the same relation can evolve from being criminogenic to being desistance supporting I love these two concepts of subsidiarity and solidarity that Beth picks up on in her work so subsidiarity is a way to supply the means of constructing we-ness or togetherness or belonging a way to move resources to support and help the other without making him or her passive or dependent so we're not talking about patronizing help we're not talking about middle class charity um, we're not talking about the patrician classes stepping into your world and transforming it for you we're talking about people going alongside you um, and this is what allows and assists the other to do what must be done to realize his or her priorities or aspirations okay but subsidiarity that, that fellow feeling that working alongside uh, can't happen uh, without solidarity and solidarity is about shared responsibility through reciprocity so this is interesting because it's a bit unlike the probation officer or probationer relationship which is not usually a reciprocal relation you provide service you also provide social control you may provide punishment depending on the legal framework in which you operate um, but it's certainly not a reciprocal relation it's an uneven one which makes this harder harder to generate this sense of subsidiarity and solidarity but not impossible I would argue okay I'm going to give you the bad news for a few slides and then I'm going to give you the good news so prepare yourself for some depressing news from desistance research first of all it really hurts and it often fails desistance I'm, I'm speaking about so again two colleagues in Scotland although one is Dutch and one is Irish Brie, uh, Marguerite Schinkel and uh, Brige Nugent they did different studies with different populations at different ages with different experiences of justice but they found in their different research studies similar experiences people were prepared to invest in transforming themselves and they did they tried to change their attitudes their skills but the same people were confronted by social isolation particularly after prison or on leaving care for young people care settings and when they when they suffered isolation they also suffered the failure to achieve goals that they'd set for themselves when they invested in their transformation and the combination of social isolation and a failure to achieve your goals produces hopelessness and hopelessness is dangerous it's dangerous to the person themselves in terms of self-harm and suicide and we have very high rates of suicide among populations subject to supervision especially post-release and dangerous to other people because hopelessness is also associated with reoffending. so 
something's going on here which is putting barriers in the way of efforts to resist and i argue that those barriers are largely structural and cultural but also sometimes systemic sometimes the kinds of practice that we pursue might make things worse for people and i'm going to give you a very bad example first and then a very good example just when things will get more fun so to to, to um, preview or to set a context for the bad example I wanted to introduce this concept of misrecognition. It's a sociological concept. Nancy Fraser is a social theorist, a feminist thinker, primarily concerned with questions of social justice and how we might pursue it. And Fraser argues that if we want a socially just society, a socially just society, sorry, then we need to redistribute material resources. We need to provide for adequate representation of all people in that society politically. And we need to offer people recognition. And recognition, she says, is often denied people in a process called misrecognition. People can be prevented from interacting in society on equal terms, on terms of parity, by institutionalized hierarchies of cultural value that deny them the requisite standing. In other words, they can't participate in society because they are seen as lesser than other people as as degraded even as subhuman subhuman is a word i hear a lot in research from people subject to criminal justice control saying they feel that they are treated like a different species i quote um other people talk about being a carceral citizen that's a concept from american research carceral citizenship or conditional citizenship but basically feeling as if you are at very best a second class citizen not like other people, not, not engaged um, on, on terms of parity. So people in that situation, Fraser says, are suffering from status inequality and from misrecognition. So misrecognition denies status, but that's not all it does, because when you misrecognize a social group, you also tend to deprive them of material resources. They are not worthy after all and you misrepresent or fail to represent them at all in political terms so you have felon disenfranchisement in america and you have disqualification from public assistance so no representation no redistribution no recognition just a semi-permanent or a permanent state of subspecies second class citizenship let me give you a, a scottish example of how this feels so this comes from a a project where, as Jan was alluding to, we used um, we actually used photographic methods, visual methods, and songwriting to explore the experience of being supervised. So this is probation or parole work I'm talking about here. It's our work. And uh, in one of the songwriting workshops, we put up pictures that had been taken by people to represent the experience of being supervised. And I was involved in co-writing this song, Blank Face, with a Scottish man called TJ. And he wrote in response to four pictures. The one I'm not showing you is a picture of a Dutch probation officer's face. So she took she took a picture of herself just sitting across the desk from an off-camera supervisee. And I'm not I'm not using that picture to protect her privacy. Uh, but the other three pictures are the ones that you see. So there's the sliding doors of a actually of a Dutch probation office, I think. Uh, there's a, a an alarm clock at, at zero hours at midnight. And there's the, the shadow cast on the ground of a children's climbing frame, which looks a bit like a spider's net in the shadow. TJ said to me, Fergus, the criminal justice system's like a spider's web. The more you struggle, the more tightly bound you become. I'm going to try to play you a little excerpt of the song so that you can get the atmosphere of the feeling that he's trying to communicate. This is the feeling of misrecognition. The clock spins zero hour begins This is the end, the end again 
sits blank face and she spins my tail I've stopped listening now I know that I'll fail Tick by tick and line by line Thread by thread now you weave mine A web of shadows, a silk spun to A windowless room Okay, so I haven't got time to play you the whole song. You can find it later if you're interested. But what he, what he's trying to convey is in these pictures he sees, particularly in the blank face of, of the probation officer, a, a bureaucrat, a, a, an official of the state who has no real interest in him, who fails to see him, certainly fails to see him as a person of any worth or value, and as soon as he sees that face, that expression, he assumes his own failure um, and, and writes about that in the song. Here sits blank face. She spins my tail. She's like the spider, but she spins my tail in a particular way. She's going to construct me as a risk, as a threat, uh, as an irredeemable, hopeless character. Um, and how is she going to do it? Well, that, this is where the, the words of the chorus are very clever, actually, and reflect practices of risk assessment. Uh, tick by tick in the boxes, line by line in the pre-sentence report, maybe, thread by thread, you're weaving my story. It's a web of shadows. It's a silk-spun tomb. It's a windowless room. I can't escape the power of this bureaucrat to tell my story in a particular way. And he ends the song by saying, you see what you want, but I know it's not real. Anyone out there who can feel what I feel. So he's, he doesn't recognize the way that the system is characterizing him. And he feels trapped and lost and degraded and with nowhere to go in the context of that working or not working relationship. Now, before I advance that slide, I want to read you something which to me is the kind of polar opposite and this is an excerpt from a research interview with a woman who I'll call Mary, uh, who came to see me about 12 years ago to take part in a study on uh, 1960s probation in Scotland. So I was trying to excavate part of our history in Scotland and I advertised in the newspapers to get people who'd been subject to probation to come and talk to me. And Mary walked in, very respectable looking elderly lady, maybe in her mid 60s, beautifully dressed, beautifully presented, very modest, very prim, very proper, very surprising, and sat down to tell me her story. And without going into too much detail, she was placed on probation at the age of 15, 16. It was for her second offence. Her first offence was vandalism. Her second offence was theft from a shop, very small value items. She had a horrible experience of court. She had a horrible experience of her first probation officer, who was austere, severe, unrelatable to her. And then she had a new probation officer appointed, who she described as turning her life around completely. We're calling her Grace in the story. Um, before I read what Mary has to say about her first encounter with Grace, the other context is that Mary was, was from a very... She'd, her family had moved from a slum area of Glasgow to a new housing estate, one of the peripheral housing schemes of the 1950s. And she'd managed to get a place in the local grammar school. So she had the prospects of a good education and she wanted to be a journalist and travel the world. But at the age of 15, her parents said, sorry, Mary, you're going to have to leave school and go to work in the factory because we need the money. And that's why she started offending. She was rebelling against class and gender based constraints that were denying her any prospect of a future. She was stuck, a bit like TJ, but in a different context. So here, here's what she says about Grace. I had to go there, I can't remember, two or three weeks time later or something like that. She said a letter would be sent. So the letter came and I went to the office and I met Grace Carswell and I can honestly say 
Grace Carswell turned my life around. Fergus. Okay. Mary. We hit it off straight away. You know, she was really, really fantastic. And instead of having to come into town to the probation office, I ended up going to see her in a school, in a primary school, which was just down the road. And she said I was to go once a week. She saw me once a week. And it was really good. You know, I was able to tell her about my home life, you know, how miserable I felt. And she asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And, you know, we just hit it off. We just hit it off. And on occasions, she'd occasionally say to come to the office in town and I would go and she would take me to tea in town. It was a place called Miss Cranston's Tea Room. It's a very ornate, beautiful tea room where in the 1960s, middle class ladies would go for tea and scones and have a lovely time. Now, you must remember, I was a 17 year old, terrible background. I never had any money. And she would take me into this beautiful tea room where all these well-dressed people were sitting and with the cake stand and the waiter coming and, you know, I'd be sitting absolutely overawed. And I thought, gosh, she's brought me here. And, you know, she brought me here. So then, and Fergus interjects, I always like this, but like a bad interviewer, when she's in the middle of her flow, I interrupt. So just about what did it convey to you that she'd brought you there? What did it mean to you? I think it said that she liked me and, you know, she listened to what I was saying and also sitting there and looking around as well. I thought I could be here too. I could do this as well. You know, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Okay. And then it, we, we started talking and she asked me what I wanted to do. And I said to her, I'd always wanted to be a journalist and I wanted to travel and I never got the opportunity. She knew all that. And then we started talking about, um, Blah, blah, blah. And the story goes on. So basically, what happens is that they conspire to help Mary escape. They co-conspire to construct a future for Mary, which involves um, finding a way for her to gain employment that will allow her to travel. And Mary uh, applies for nurse training um, and asks the question of Grace, what will I do if they ask about my criminal record? And Grace says, if they don't ask don't tell. They don't ask. So Mary qualifies as a nurse. She gains a specialism. She travels the world. She works in India, in Australia, in Canada. She meets her husband overseas. They come back to Scotland. They raise three children. They live happily ever after. And Mary's coming into my office 50 years after the event to say, she changed my life. It's an amazing story. Um, how is it so different from the TJ story? Well, some things that Grace does, and you won't find these in the effective practice manuals. You might in Jan's book, though, because it's a good book. Um, but this is kind of even before we get to the question of core skills, there's something very fundamental about what Grace does. Firstly, she moves towards Mary. And I mean that both literally and metaphorically. She moves towards her. She doesn't maintain hierarchy and distance. She isn't like the austere judge or the austere first probation officer. Instead, she moves towards her, tries to close the gap between them. She practices hospitality. And I didn't read that part, but that means, you know, welcoming her to the office, offering her a drink, just basic stuff, but important stuff. So she's not a hostile authority. She's welcoming. She listens really attentively to Mary's story and to what Mary wants. So she doesn't lecture. The judge lectured and the first probation officer lectured. You need to get into that factory, Mary, get your head down and go on with work and accept your station in life. That's what the first probation officer said, more or less. She hears and she validates Mary's story. She doesn't impose another story on her, like everyone else in her life. She shows Mary her potential. She takes her to the tea room and that's the turning point in the story. That's the moment. Um, so she doesn't fix Mary in her current social position. She opens up the possibility of her onward movement. And then she sets about co-authoring that future with Mary, including by licensing Mary to silence her discrediting past. Okay, 
So TJ's stuck because blank face isn't recognizing him. She's leaving him in an unequal, vulnerable, and degraded position from which there is no movement, irrespective of his changed disposition. He can transform himself, transform himself all he likes. He's going nowhere. Mary's recognition by grace means that her movement, not just through the probation order, but in her wider life trajectory, is enabled. So to get back to reintegrative momentum, and I'm coming to the closing here, um, and I'm going to break this down into some different practice roles to think about so that you can kind of begin to connect this directly to, to what you're trying to do this week. I've, I've used desistance literature to redefine rehabilitation and models of rehabilitation. And I'm not going to go into great detail about these today. There isn't time, but there are papers that I can direct you to if you're interested. Um, so I've broken it into four forms of rehabilitation. Most of what you'll focus on this week and most of what you'll find in the literature and most of what we do actually in correctional practice is personal rehabilitation. It's trying to support the development of the individual to live and act differently. But it, it works on them or with them to try to transform something about them. Equally important though is judicial or legal rehabilitation. Because as long as you've got the sticky big label stuck on you, then your transformation won't take you very far. So what are we doing about peeling off the sticky label, about dealing with the problem of criminal records? Catalonia is a very uh, progressive jurisdiction in respect of the way that criminal records are managed in comparison with my country or, God forbid, North America, where you can Google someone's criminal records. Um, so legal and judicial rehabilitation is really important uh, to restore status, to, to formally address the inequality that punishment creates. Moral rehabilitation is about reconciliation between those that the offence has harmed and the offender. And, and we assume that state punishment deals with that. It rarely goes anywhere near it. And if there is no reconciliation, then there's a barrier in the community unless the person is moving away. So there may be a need for more reparative or restorative practices to address moral rehabilitation. Social rehabilitation is about acceptance. It's about belonging. It's about being socially included. And different forms of recognition relate to the different forms of rehabilitation. Recognition of personal potential is the kind of starting point of personal rehabilitation. People can change. Otherwise, why are you trying? Recognition of restored and equal citizenship is a legal issue we need to address. Recognition of moral and political worth is about how we do dialogue around reconciliation and civic restoration. And recognition as a member of a community is linked to social rehabilitation. Um, I'll skip that one. I wanted to, to talk briefly about a development of that model by a Spanish scholar, Alejandro Rivio Arnal, who's back in Barcelona to do his postdoc at the Pompeu Fabra University. And just to those of you that are from Catalonia, Alejandro's postdoc is about trying to study communities that are reintegrative. And those might be communities of place or communities of interest, like groups or services even. Uh, where people are experiencing reintegration after punishment, and he wants to choose at least two or three such communities and compare what they're doing uh, to develop further the model which he developed doing his PhD research with me in Glasgow. So Alejandro talks about personal development. He adds material resources as a, as a crucial aspect of reintegration, which I can't believe I missed, but obviously people need money and a place to stay if they're to sustain a life in the community. So material resources matter. And he disaggregates from moral repair, the reconciliation business, civic political rights and participation. That's more about political representation and engagement. And so we now have six forms of reintegration that we need to pursue. And the key point here is that these forms of reintegration are interdependent. So if we only do work in one of these six domains, but we don't attend to the other five, we're wasting our time and the public's money. Now, that might not be an argument that you can have day to day in your office. It might be an argument for the director of probation to have with the minister of justice and the prime minister or the president, because I think most criminal justice systems I'm aware of are contradictory. 
they they invest a certain amount of money in personal development of people in the correctional system while excluding them from the labor market through the way they handle criminal records they promote the rejection of those people through the, the public political discourse of offenders the dangerous people the others the people who are not like us while at the same time saying they need to take up their place in society and pay their taxes like everybody else so there's contradiction all over policy in this area but let's think about this uh, in in relation to the roles that you might undertake as a probation officer and and if i list these six roles related to the six different forms i wonder which you most closely relate to in fact let's just do a quick show of hands as we go through these do you think it's your job to coach people in their personal development raise your hand if you do okay do you think it's your job to help people access material resources that they need in order to survive in the community do you think it's your job to try to elevate the judicial or legal status of people that you're supervising not so sure maybe that's for judges maybe it's a a, a kind of bit above our pay grade but you could I mean you could argue that if you have a um a graduation ritual at the end of a probation order or a period of supervision you're doing a kind of status elevation maybe some people do that do you think it's part of your job to advocate for civic and political participation of people with convictions yeah one or two hands do you think it's your job to mediate moral repair between victims and offenders and communities yeah and do you think it's your job to broker the social inclusion of people who've been excluded by punishment yeah mostly so the, the, the strongest votes were for coaching and brokering which doesn't surprise me because I think that's largely what we've been engaged in but I, I think we we need to think about all six of those um so I've, I've run over time by a couple of minutes so I'm just going to finish now by kind of drawing some threads together so again going back to the difference between TJ and Mary and thinking about this as the foundation of doing good correctional work rehabilitation misrecognizes when it's a monologue this is ironic to say this after speaking at you for an hour <laughs> but rehabilitation misrecognizes when it's a monologue and when the state or its agents impose narratives of people on people so the problem there is that it creates a problem of legitimacy if you're trying to influence people the first thing you should do surely is listen to them that's the way we all work in our everyday lives in our friendship groups in our families you know with, with our children with our parents um when we're trying to support one another with problems we listen first so monologues about rehabilitation are deeply problematic on all sorts of levels they're also counterproductive people don't respond well to monologues um rehabilitation recognizes by contrast and finds legitimacy when it's dialogical as in the case of grace she listens and she hears before she begins to speak and that's what begins to establish the possibility of forward movement where we are respecting people both as they are and for what they can become but crucially we have to recognize that becoming is a social process not a personal process um so in this sense I would argue rehabilitation and reintegration are less about correcting individuals I really don't like the word correctional at all but I understand why we use it um it's not even about enabling their return to society I sometimes talk as if it was about going back that's the language of re after all re-inclusion reinsertion reintegration rehabilitation actually it might be more to do with forward movement it might be about moving on um and mobility requires recognition and dialogue as the foundations then there's a lot of other building to do but you've got a week to do it so I hope I've laid some good foundations and that that was useful I know it's a very warm room so I can see quite a lot of shiny people in the audience <laughs> so thank you for listening thank you very much uh, Sandra, for your great presentation and uh, another great news is that more and more oh my okay 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Another great uh, news is that a lot of uh, countries, a lot of jurisdictions around the world are taking this kind of uh, whole society approach when it comes to reintegration. So it does not uh, abandon only probation services to deal with uh, the, the issue of criminality, but involves social services, labor agencies, housing services and so on in a kind of coherent system. And I know that it's something going on now in Sweden in this respect. There are a lot of good examples from Norway, uh, Finland, and so on. So I'm sure that one day we will get to this kind of uh, aspects of reintegration where we will play our role, of course. Um, another thing that I would like to mention before I uh, open the floor for questions is to say that although we are focusing here on core correctional skills and we are talking about mainly developing so, uh, personal capital, we, we don't say that uh, for any minute that uh, they are the only ones that matter in our work. We have to look at these skills in dialogue with the other interventions that we have in, in order to develop social capital, to facilitate access to pro-social opportunities, to work with other agencies to, to, you know, to make you know, this kind of uh, uh, things uh, uh, possible. So we are just focusing on them because they are, uh, let's say, more in our control and more that, you know, and we have enough evidence saying that if we do this well, we we will really influence the, the, the systems process and uh, eventually reduce the offending. But that doesn't mean that it's all that we can do in our work. Now, I would like to open the floor for questions. We, we have like five to 10 minutes for questions before break. Um, we've, got, we've got one in the chat there from yeah, the Zoom call, so I, I can just respond to that, which yeah, is please. basically asking about, um, well, blank faces a probation officer, so working with a person in the community, how does, how do the ideas apply to people in prison for prison staff as well? And I would say, arguably, um, e equally well, if not more so, um, in prison, uh, the the power differential and the exposure to control is more obvious, and so is the harm of punishment and the hardship of punishment than it than it is in relation to supervision in the community. Those, those things are present in both places, I would argue, and I, I, as as Jan has also written about, we know that being supervised is painful, even when it's supportive. So there there is suffering involved in being supervised, uh, whether you're inside a correctional facility or under some form of community supervision. But I would argue that in both contexts, um, moral recognition is the beginning of effective practice um, and, and the beginning of meaningful engagement. Alison Liebling at the University of Cambridge, uh, who, who studies prisons and prison cultures and what she calls the moral climates of prisons all around the world, uh, I think stresses this point very forcefully in her research. Prisons where people feel morally recognized, where prisoners feel morally recognized by staff are safer for everybody. There's less self-harm, there's less suicide, there's less violence, and there's more possibility of personal development also in those prisons. So uh, trying to find ways to model and express moral recognition is crucially important in prison context too. I'll give you a, a simple example of misrecognition or non-recognition. The one that Scottish people in prison or after prison often cite to me is the complaint about the indignity of having to go to an officer on the landing in the hall to ask for toilet paper and how some officers use that as a moment to be powerful by not responding or by responding exceptionally slowly leaving a person in an obviously degraded position of significant discomfort over something as basic as toilet roll so handling Handling a, a basic request for something like that in a way which dignifies the person and, and uh, sustains as far as is possible in a prison context, their sense of self-worth is crucially important. Excellent. Thank you, Fergus. Questions from the room? Or you are boiling already? You want to go out <laughs> and have a fresh air? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, you were talking about the social, um, the, the first line of social uh, engagement and the second line. Could it also be a religious community or something? Yeah. Yeah. Like a yeah, no, re religious communities or faith groups can and do often provide 
a context in which the possibility of being accepted and moving forward uh, exists for, for obvious reasons. Like if, if you're talking about faith communities in which there is a theology of redemption and also a shared acceptance of, to use a Christian expression, sinfulness, yeah. you know, if, if, if we all recognize that we fall short, then the kind of community that we construct, which is in, in the context of religious communities, rooted in understanding how we fall short and how we move forward together in spite of that is potentially likely to be uh, a place where reintegration is possible however it's also true that religious communities can be extremely condemnatory um so it, it depends on the characteristics yeah. and beliefs and values of the religious community there's some really interesting research on desistance in different cultural contexts which was undertaken in london by uh a researcher called Adam Calverley, where he compared the experiences of Bangladeshi Muslim men, Indian Sikh men, and black and dual heritage men, all in the same London borough, but in different, uh, living within di different ethnic communities, which themselves are experiencing British society in different ways because of the, their different histories of yeah. migration. So without going into enormous detail, the Indian, Hindu, and Sikh people were better reintegrated into the labor market because there were a lot of small business people in their community. The Bangladeshi Muslim people were better reintegrated into their religious community because the mosque was a place where redemption was possible. Um, and the black and dual heritage offenders had the toughest time and were suffering the kind of isolation and hopelessness that I talked about in the presentation because uh, their community wasn't faring well in terms of either labor market participation or business development um uh, and their kind of relig religiosity had waned to the point that faith communities weren't providing any kind of meaningful support to most of them so uh, their pattern of desistance such as it was was much more isolated they only moved between the apartment they lived in and the gym yeah those were the only sites where they could avoid offending and construct some kind of life but it was a pretty um a pretty kind of basic and underdeveloped kind of social life i guess you could yeah. argue so the cultural context makes a massive difference and faith communities will play differently for different people that's a very good example of why the individualization of the assessment of the relevance of the social context is so important yeah um thank you One more question before break. Yes. Um, I was wondering about the example with um, taking the client to the cafe and the meaning it's had. I've heard about things like this being done in probation work in the 80s, in the 90s. Uh, I feel that it has disappeared. We basically sit in the office, meet the clients there. Is it possible to get the same effect without taking the client outside anywhere, without having this casual context where we meet? If we only sit in the in the office in the government building or, or a community building and meet the and have the desk between us? Yeah, I think I think it's possible, but it's harder. So. If you think about the human relationships, human relationships in general are deepened by spending time together. This is banal and true. Uh, and a lot of the time, the development is not based on the conversation that you're having. You know, you're not actively developing the depth of your relationship. You're hanging out in order to get to know each other in order to kind of become more acquainted, in order to have the chance conversation about a shared interest that you didn't know was shared between you, like the guitar or the pets, as we started off this morning. So when we go to the pub later, if we go to the pub later, um, we've already got some clues about things that we might have in common or that we might ask each other about. You're all going to want to talk to me about my songwriting. I can sense that. Um, so. I've got the, the personalize it slightly thing 
changes the dynamic in the room in between us. And in different probation contexts, people are approaching that in different ways. So I've, in, in England, for example, some, some people have introduced walking meetings. So that instead of meeting in the office, you go for a walk with your client. And that can be both about learning more about their community as you walk around it, or it can just be about how the dynamic of a conversation changes when you're side by side instead of face by face to face. Um, I've heard of probation offices where they've introduced uh, a film club. People come and watch movies and they talk about movies together or a book group or, you know, any any kind of social activity which might be uh, conducive towards the development of better relationships. Sports, shared sports is another one. Um, probation offices where the clients and staff might play five-a-side football together or something like that. Um, now these all do sound a little retro, even as I, even as I describe them. But I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't reinvent those kinds of practices or reintroduce them thoughtfully and carefully. And I also think more generally, and maybe this is a conversation to have as the week progresses. I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had about the pros and cons of professional distance, and what the right amount of it is. Um, too much and your blank face too little and you're probably dangerous in a different way so what how do you how do you find um a reasonable point where your relationship can be enriched for example by writing a song together so we've got in the project where the songwriting takes place we now do have pro uh, probation officers or social workers as they are in Scotland and some of their clients co-writing songs and workshops together that where they're reflecting on on a, a theme um and i know from from experience that the practice of thinking through how you communicate an experience in a song and then having a dialogue about that will alter the quality and depth of your relationship with the co-writer so there's lots of creative ways that we might think about how we how we deal with the problem of distance too much and too little and how we get that right yes i have the, the mic i would like also to comment on that because i think it's a very important topic and we'll touch on that in our next uh, topic when we discuss about uh the the working alliance i also think that it's it's a good time for us to go back on the street to go back to the unit to the communities i think we retreat from the street too much and we lost touch with what's going on in the communities and now we find it quite difficult to go back and help and find the necessary help that we need for our clients so i think we need to, to do that and to, to, to promote a, a kind of outside relationships with our clients and with the, with, the, with the communities but at the same time i also think that we need to pay to be careful how we do that uh i i, I like what what fergus is doing with the songwriting and so on but I think in our job as, as probation officers, we need to pay attention to professional boundaries as well, because we have to balance very well the, the, the care, but also the control that we are, we are invested with. We, are, we still need to, to observe some limits and I, we have to be careful how we do that. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I was giving a training in Albania uh, and uh, like in many other jurisdictions in Europe, uh, most of the probation officers are uh, female and most of the clients are male. So they, after the presentation about the working alliance, they came to me and said, well, what can we do it to avoid the invitations for the coffee uh, with our clients? Uh, if, if you open up too much, if you are not clear with uh, your role and your boundaries, you, you end up you know, in, in, with these kind of invitations that you need to you know, sometimes to uh, refuse uh, and when you do that you might create some kind of tensions and some kind of you know undesirable feelings in, in your clients so finding a, a good way to have maybe not too much maybe not too little but maybe enough relationship that's the art that we need to master thank you very much now I think it's a good time to have a, a breakfast to have fresh air and uh, we come back at uh, 20 past 12 for for the next uh, uh, topic on the agenda. Thank you very much. Half an hour, yeah.